coming. This is the uh, second of our interview series at the festival. We also had a keynote speaker come in to introduce this symposium element of the festival that's kind of threading through with all the performances. So we're very happy you're here, and we hope that you continue to follow this pathway uh, with dialogues between the artists and activists. We have next weekend two more, uh, one, no, we have three more next weekend. Uh, Julie Lichtenberg and Kimi Maeda will be speaking about the first generation experience in America and uh, in the US. And uh, Ruben Dario Salazar will be interviewed from Cuba about puppetry in Cuba, the arts in Cuba. And Eric Bass and Roberto Salomon will be speaking about their international collaboration of a work they've been doing in El Salvador. So all many exciting themes continued next weekend. Please come back again. Please purchase your festival t-shirt. If you haven't seen them yet, art designed by Jana Zeller with an image from Magali's show, which also, if you haven't seen that, that's going to be performed tonight at 7 o'clock. If it's raining, it, it will, will be raining, it, and the venue will be 118 Elliott Street. There we are. So shift in venue. If you haven't seen that, please, please come. It's a free performance. Absolutely stunning. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce this interview. And we're actually going to let it be led in graciously by Scott Ainsley with a little art burst for you. Thank you, sir. This is a song, a true story song, uh, that I wrote after hearing a, a, a report on National Public Radio of the search for a woman named Gracia Cruz, who was lost on June 23rd in 2007 in the Sonoran Desert. The facts in the song are all uh, straight out of that, out of her story. It's a, it's a
Thank you, Scott. That was amazing. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm John Potter. I'm a re recovering journalist. Uh, used to be the arts editor of the Brattleboro Reformer. Now I'm the executive director of the Latches, and I'm very pleased and proud and honored uh, to have been asked by Sanglass to facilitate these uh, conversations. I'm here today with Shura Wallen, a founder of Green Valley Samaritans out of Arizona and Alejandro Benitez Cuellar, director of Mexico's Facto Teatro. Um, and we'll find out a little bit more about, uh, about them and what they do very shortly. Um, the general um, theme today is U.S.-Mexico rela relations. Um, and I just want to frame this with a couple of thoughts that came to me uh, as I was preparing. Uh, for those of us who live 2,000 miles away from the U.S.-Mexico border, um, the issues along that border are a comfortable abstraction, I think, grounded in uh, statistics and numbers and data and sound bites and stereotypes uh, and devoid of the humanity and, and the reality um, around it. Although I did find it interesting that a million dollars of products are traded legally across the border every minute. It is a very, very powerful uh, locus. Uh, when we think of Mexico at all, many of us here, it's because um, some candidate with appalling hair said something inflammatory, or we hear that somebody wants to build a bigger and better wall, um, and however much we know it in our hearts, uh, the stereotypes that we've received uh, often still, still form, our, form our judgments. I'm as guilty of anyone of profound ignorance about uh, Mexico I made one brief foray into Tijuana when I was younger for a night of music and revelry, which I will never forget. Uh, but that hardly makes me an expert in preparing for this conversation. <laughs> and willing to learn. Uh, in preparing for, for this conversation, I spent more time thinking about and looking into Mexico than I ever have before in my life, mea culpa. Um, I think if we think about um, Mexico at all, we don't think about our shared humanity, our common ties through faith and family, community and culture, uh, and enter Sandglass uh, and all of us here to begin to work on this. I'd like to conclude with something I found. It's a quote from uh, the great cellist Pablo Casals, who said, the love of one's country is a splendid thing, but why should love stop at the border? And I think with that, we'll uh, turn it over to our guests. Um, and I think perhaps we could start by finding out a little bit more about what you do. And sure, why don't you, why don't you tell us uh, okay. in I will a few words or less. A few <laughs> and words. And then we'll dig deeper. Okay. I'll give you, I, I'm not a person of few words, but I'll try. Um, I'll give you a brief 
summary. I lived in Berkeley, California for 28 years. During uh, my time there, 14 years was spent with the homeless. I co-founded and coordinated a program, a food program for the homeless. And in 2000, June of 2000, my husband and I moved from Berkeley to Green Valley, Arizona, um, which is basically halfway between Tucson and Nogales. And it wasn't, it was shortly before we left that I began hearing from some of my Latino friends this, we don't want them to come. And I thought, what is this all about? Never read anything in the paper or papers about what was happening on the Arizona desert, the Texas desert, whatever. Um, so I kind of tucked that away and I thought, well, they're probably afraid for their jobs. You know, they're afraid that they're going to lose their jobs. And um, we moved in June of 2000 and my husband was still working in the, the Bay Area. And so I was in Green Valley by myself um, for the first summer. And about a month after we were down there, I read in the paper about this group called Humane Borders. And Humane Borders is a group that uh, puts recycled Coca-Cola containers out on the desert with a picture of the Big Dipper, a 30-foot pole, and a blue flag um, for migrants who come across who are thirsty. And it is not uncommon for us to find bullet holes in those water tanks, it's not uncommon for us to uh, find the spigots turned on and all of the water has run out. And I thought, well, this is something I could do. And I got involved with Humane Borders and used to do these water runs. And then another group uh, in Tucson was started called Tucson Samaritans, got involved with them as well. And then along came another group called No More Deaths. and. Um, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I could get a group started in Green Valley? Green Valley is extremely conservative, um, and it is a retirement community. And so one day in Ju January of 2005, Randy Mayer, who's a minister at the UCC Church, the Good Shepherd, uh, in Sao Rito, which is adjacent to Green Valley, had a one-day symposium on immigration. And a friend of mine from Tucson had brought down a, a two, three ar articles and items that had been found on the desert and things that had been left behind and a sign-up sheet. And so at the end of the day, she said, you're not going to believe this. There are a number of people here who would like to get involved. And that's what started us. Um, our first search, and I will tell you what we do, um, our first search was February 5th, 2005. First thing that we do is to search for people. We take backpacks of food and water, medical supplies, some socks. We walk on the desert calling out in Spanish, don't be afraid, we're here to help you. We have food, water, and assistance. That's the number one thing. The second thing that we do is we put water out, gallons of water, with um, GPS coordinate on the bottle, Green Valley Samaritans, and the date that we've dropped the water in strategic areas, um, areas where we know, we feel that people are coming. Um, there is a retired geology professor uh, from the University of Arizona who has mapped all of the trails that migrants have used. So we know we can follow, we follow um, the, the clues that are out there, things that have been left behind, how fresh they are, and so on and so forth. And also we get word you know, of which way people are coming from a variety of sources. And um, the reason for the GPS coordinate is that if we find a bottle, say hypothetically, um, five miles from that waypoint, that gives us an idea that maybe people are changing directions and we can, we can target that area in hopes of finding people who are in desperate need. Um, a brief story about one of our water, water bottles recently, a 12-year-old girl who had been raped repeatedly by the coyote who had been in charge of her group was left behind 
and obviously left behind to die, was extremely hot. She found one of our water bottles, and the water bottle is what saved her life. A Border Patrol agent found her and carried her to safety. So with, with everything, if, if that bottle saved one person's life, we have done what we have set out to do. Okay. Another thing that we do, uh, in addition to putting the water bottles out, we, we used to do, and we don't do this as frequently as we did in the past, we would do what is called basura. The items left behind by people are often referred to as trash. I don't see them in that, in that way, but nonetheless, um, we feel an obligation to help clean up the desert. And so we will uh, scout different areas, and when we find what is called a layup spot, which is a, a place where people have been waiting for a ride, when a ride arrives, they cannot take anything with them other than what fits in their pockets. So everything is left behind, okay? And so we will pick up items. We sort through everything for identification, um, things that can be reused. We take home, we wash, we, we recycle. I take a lot of the things to Mexico because I work in Mexico every week with migrants who have been returned. And um, the other things we discard. And um, we hope that this, this is helping to maintain uh, the geography of the desert and um, keep it in pristine condition as, as best we can. Um, we also have groups that go to Operation Streamline, which is the court proceedings that take place uh, every day of the week. Um, up to 70 migrants are uh, processed in court. They are taken into court at 9.30 in the morning. They are handcuffed to a chain around their waist uh, with chains running down their legs and shackled. And they sit in court until 1.30 in the afternoon when they go before the judge. They've been uh, able to see a lawyer perhaps for a half an hour and then they are sentenced or whatever the judge determines. Um, basically, those are the things that we do. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Alejandro, would you tell us about what you do? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to apologize because my English is not real good, but I, I will try to, to make myself clear. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an actor, a puppeteer, also a drummer, and I've been doing puppetry for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, for the last 10 years, I became uh, really involved with uh, toy theater or paper theater, and I have my own company that is called Facto Teatro. And uh, I, st I started doing paper theater, which is my main um, job now, because uh, I, I first went to the Great Small Works International Toy Theater Festival in New York 10 years ago, and I, I was just amazed by the marvelous world that was opening in front of my eyes, and because they organized this uh, museum and uh, they, they had these multiple um, techniques uh, doing toy theater, so I decided that I wanted to do that. But also I saw them, um, I saw the results of a, of a workshop that they, they did with these uh, young people from uh, very poor uh, high schools in Queens and uh, in Brooklyn. And I saw that this is a marvelous tool for education. So I said that uh, maybe th th this can work in Mexico, and I was uh, I was a theater teacher on a on a high school in Mexico, and uh, I said okay let's try it now, and it was marvelous. It was just uh, pure magic for either students and the teachers, and uh, since then I I have uh, been trying to to give this technique to, to to Mexico because also as you know we are in a huge economical and uh, social crisis now there. And I think paper is just at the reach of anybody's hand, you know? And uh, also, it doesn't have this uh, strong wall between the artist and the audience. No, it, it is not like that because uh, it brings the child inside 
everyone. So it's magic. And everyone, after each show, people approach and say, ah, how do you do this? And how do you do that? Like, OK, it's just as simple as this. You can do it at home. And you can share it with your family, because this is how this technique was born. And uh, since then, I, I, now I organize uh, an international uh, paper theater festival in Mexico City since 2012. And uh, it has been great. Now there are at least 10 or 11 professional paper theater companies in Mexico City. So I'm very happy. <laughs> That's pretty much Thank it. Thank you. To continue with you, Alejandro, I yeah. think a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I, w I was one of those who just saw your performance. Thank you very much. If you haven't, please, please do so at 3 o'clock at the Latches. It's really, really enchanting. Um, it's not specifically political about the issues, um, and it's not uh, as uh, sort of upfront activist as um, uh, Shura's work. Uh, but tell me the ways in which um, the things that are going on in Mexico today are reflected and examined and um, celebrated in your work, and, and um, you know, what is the activist side of, of what you do? Of course, I mean, right now we just went back in time, and uh, we have the same government that uh, were uh, in the power for, for, for 75 years. Uh, I mean, we, we never had, uh, during the 20th century, a military dictatorship. It was worst because it was disguised as a democratic government. So they say, OK, you can vote, but your vote doesn't care, you know? And uh, in the year 2000, we were so happy because that was the first time in 75 years that we had this change in, in the government. I mean, it was the right wing party, but I mean, it was a change. <laughs> and, the thing is that the political and social system in Mexico is <coughs> rotten from the very roots. It, it was made to protect the powerful people, and it was made uh, to be, you know, you can, you, you can just, uh, if you have money, you can do anything you want in Mexico, as clear as that. You can kill a person. You can steal what you want. You can do whatever you want if you have money to pay. That's it. And uh, I think. As, you, as John said, uh, with Facto Teatro, we are not, we don't have a political agenda uh, per se, but what we do is to try to remind people that there is beauty in the world because now they are killing journalists, they are killing teachers, they are killing students, they are killing almost anyone that dares to raise their voice, their voice because now our government, uh, in our government, there are just ignorant and very stupid people. You know, it's it's it's, it's the worst uh, time for Mexico in the modern era. It, it's it's just it's just scary. And uh, one of the best ways that I found that I can do something is to bring art to the people to to remind them that uh, I mean, I think that each human being. Is a creator, can uh, has the the, the cap, uh, ¿cómo se dice? la capacidad. Thank you very much. De crear, <laughs> of create something, and uh, people just forget that in Mexico. People just uh, want to have more material things, and the the young generation now is convinced. I mean, not everybody, of course, but uh, mostly the most. Uh, poor ones and the most uneducated people, they just want to have as much uh, material things and money they can have. It doesn't matter if that, if that turns out that, uh, that, that they get killed, you, you know, because they can sell drugs, they can steal, they can kidnap, and it doesn't matter because with that you can make much more money than working for a whole year in just one, you know? and. Um, I think it's very, very, very sad because now the younger generation doesn't have any value besides what is uh, what, what the television or what the media it's it's telling them because they want. I mean, the U.S. influence in Mexico is strong. I mean, 
we grew up uh, listening to the music in English. We grew up uh, going to the movies and seeing all these uh, movies in English. And I mean, I don't. I, I am not saying that it's bad because I love rock and roll. I love. <laughs> I love jazz. I love jeans. <laughs> you know, th those good things and uh, all the culture uh, and everything. But what what what's going on in Mexico is that everybody wants to to be. A, I, I want to say it to be gringo. But we are not gringos. You know, and it's it's very hard to change this this kind of thinking, this way of thinking, sorry. I, I don't know, I mean, no. Do you see um, part of what you do as, um, as countering that, to yeah. uh, restore uh, some of their mm -hmm. um, um, you know, natural, um, where they're from, their culture, yeah, uh, uh, to uh, them? And uh, also, you know, because uh, talking about stereotypes, we also have a lot of stereotypes about the US and Mexico, of course. I mean, uh, in Mexico, uh, I, I made a show with this uh, theater company. It wasn't puppets. It, it was a th theater with a hand-to-mouth theater from Portland, Oregon. And uh, we made this, this uh, collaboration between La Divina, La Divina Comedia, which was a company that I was working with, and uh, hand-to-mouth theater about how both countries see each other. And we were working, and we were just realizing that we were very ignorant about each other because we only have the information we received from the TV or from the, the movies or from music. And uh, it, it was just crazy because uh, we had this part where everybody was saying uh, just one archetype that we have. And one, one of uh, my Mexican colleagues say, OK, I think in the US, everybody, <laughs> uh, it, it's, on a, it's on a horse with his cowboy hat and just shooting, no? And, and, they're, and they're very drunk. <laughs> and and, and one, one of the, uh, the colleagues from uh, Portland, she said, OK, in Mexico, everybody lives under a palm tree. Mm -hmm. and They are just uh, scratching their bellies the whole day. And everything just, <laughs> you know? It was ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. And we, we learned so much about each other, just working for about uh, one year. We, we were going back and forth to, to, to Portland and to Mexico City. And also, we are very far away from, for, from the northern border of the country. Uh, Mexico City is, uh, uh, I, I think, a thousand miles away from, from the border. And also, we don't know much about it. And we are just realizing in this past two or three years that the situation for migrantes in Mexico is much, much worse in Mexico than in the US. Because there is this huge crime organization, I mean, narcs. And now we are, we are learning that there is this uh, body, uh, body part selling, I mean, organs. They are killing children. They are killing people just to, because nobody cares about migrantes. Nobody gives nothing about them. So. We can sell. We can sell them. We can sell their livers. We can sell their hearts. We can. It's just horrible. And now we are realizing that in Mexico, I mean, to cross from the south of the border of Mexico to the U.S. is just pure hell for Central American and South American people. And uh, there's a. I mean, I know there's this uh, statis estadística. Uh, that, that says that at least 90% of women, children, men, every age, gets robbed, raped, mm. mutilated, or killed in their way to the US, in Mexico. And the government is very involved in this, because you don't, you don't understand how this huge organization is working without the bless of the Mexican government and the local governments in every state that where you know the train that brings people from all the way it's called la bestia the beast mm -hmm. and it's a now it's a very scary word because we know that if you go on the beast something terrible will happen to you sure would you talk to us a little bit about um, what you know about who who you're serving and helping who are the, who are these people and mm -hmm. uh, what circumstances bring them the United States. What we're seeing now are uh, predominantly Central Americans. Um, 
Guatemala, El Salvador, um, Honduras, and uh, Chiap people from Chiapas, which is in Mexico. But by and large, uh, they're indigenous people. Many of them do not speak Spanish. They only speak their, their dialect. Um, they are coming because they are starving to death, for one thing. And secondly, they're coming because of all of the violence. And they're trying to get their children out. I cannot tell you the number of children that I have seen who have come by themselves, by themselves. And not long ago, there was a young boy sitting by himself at the Comedor, which is a, a dining room in Nogales, Sonora, which is run, started by the uh, Sisters of the Eucharist, and the Jesuits have taken over, and it's called the Kino Border Initiative. And, and um, every morning, um, after migrants have been deported, they go to immigration in uh, Nogales. They get a piece of paper with their picture, their name, and the date of deportation. They take that to the Comedor, and it allows them to eat there for two meals a day for, th for three days. It used to be that they allowed them to eat for 14 days, and then through time they realized that most people are not staying for 14 days. They're going to be moving on, so they've cut it down to three. If there are extenuating circumstances, the person can come probably as long as they need to come. Um, but this 14-year-old boy was sitting by himself, and I went over and sat down next to him, put my arm around him, and asked him where he was from. He was from Honduras. And I said, did you come with friends or family? And he said, no. And I said, where are you going? And he said he was going to Oxnard, California. Someone had told him, given him the name Oxnard, because that's an agricultural area. And I said, do you have family or friends in the United States? And he said, no. He was going to cross by himself. He had come on the train. Now, fortunately, he wasn't pushed off the train. The trains are controlled by the gangs. Salva Maratrucha from El Salvador is one of the big gangs. And my understanding is that they formed when they were in prison in Los Angeles. And they went back, and they are absolutely ruthless. And uh, it's not only are they involved, but the police along the way, wherever the train stops, the police are there extorting money, whatever the people have, extorting money from them. And they have nothing to begin with, and they have less than nothing when they get back on the train, if they're lucky. Okay. And so with that, we're seeing a lot of young people come, um, again, mostly ind indigenous, and that doesn't mean that we don't see people from Mexico. Um, we see a lot of people who have been returned, who have been in the United States for <coughs> years and years and years. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. And uh, another very, very distressing thing here is that we're beginning to see older people, and by that I mean people in their early 70s who are getting ready to cross the desert again because they have no family in Mexico or Central America. Their family is in the United States. The United States is what they know. Now, to cross that desert, it takes roughly a week to walk from Nogales to Tucson. That's if you are going in a straight line. Now, how much food and how much water can you carry with you to get you through that trip? Not to mention the number of people who are preying on not only, not only the gangs, but people who are preying on the migrants as they cross. The coyotes, the guides, are part and parcel of this. They really do not care. That's just the bottom line. You, if someone dies in the desert, it's not uncommon for the coyote to get in touch with the family and say, I have your son and I need another $3,000 by tomorrow or your son is dead. You as the family member have no idea that your son 
or your daughter or your loved one has died. No idea. So those are the kinds of things that we see pretty much on a daily basis. And the desperation is palpable. And we are as involved in that desperation as Mexico is. We run hand in hand. You, you know, exactly what you are saying about the coyotes and they don't care, it's what happened with the authorities and the government. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. Because uh, narcotraffic and, um, I mean, corruption is a way of life in Mexico. And I think uh, the, the people with power, and I, I, I'm, I'm saying economical or political power, they just see everybody else like merchandise. Uh, as expensable, is, is that a word? I mean, uh, expendable. Uh, expendable. Expendable. Thank you. As expendable merchandise. I mean, they don't see the other as a human being. I think that's the main problem because uh, the, 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 the level of dehumanization, if that's a word, that uh, now it's going on in Mexico is just, it's just horrible. They just don't care. And uh, that, that point of view is, uh, is just spreading all over the society because it, it doesn't matter. I mean, everybody's trying to survive. No, of course, there are a lot of good things in Mex Mexico. There, there is a lot of good people in Mexico, but the feeling that we have now is that uh, it's getting um, Menos, it's getting less and less and less, thank you, less and less and less. So that, 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 that's what, what's going on, that we feel that this crisis now is really serious for everybody. It doesn't matter if you have money or you are middle class or if you are very poor, it doesn't matter. It just touch everybody there. And so I think that's the key. You know? But I also think that, I think you're absolutely right. Thanks. I think also that the vast majority of people still do not understand what is pushing people to leave their homes and to come here. They just don't get it. And I hear in my own community, well, they are only, they are coming to take our jobs. They are coming to do this. They are coming. They are coming here to um, steal flat, I've heard this, flat screen TVs. They're, they're carrying flat screen TVs across the desert, you know, with all of what I call our knickknacks. That's the only reason that they're coming. You can't trust them at all. And, uh, you know, they are absolutely up to no good. And nothing could be further from the truth. Yes, you have a faction of people, not unlike in our own society, we have a faction of people who are up to no good. But the vast majority of people are not like that. Mm. The vast majority of people aren't. And it's very difficult to get people to understand this. And I say to people who make these outrageous statements, I will say, you come with me. You come with me to Mexico. You come with me to the Comedor. You look into the faces of these folks who are suffering so terribly. And then you tell me, then you make that statement that you just made after we leave there. You tell me because nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. And also, I think it's a worldwide situation because it's yes, the same it case in Europe uh, with, yeah. with the migration from uh, Africa or Asia. I mean, also in Mexico, we have uh, migrants from Central America and it's the same case. I mean, uh, they are treated like they are not human beings. Right. It's the same because uh, when, when, I mean, we, we, we wonder why they want to go to Mexico because it's terrible, but imagine how's the situation in their countries, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also there, there's the issue of racism, mm -hmm. which is palpable. And case in point, our government issues warnings to us, the State Department, don't go to Mexico. Don't go into Mexico. Mexico is very dangerous. And yet we have no compunctions about deporting women, babies, children, young boys and girls who are ripe for the picking and others in the middle of the night to Nogales as one case in point. And they have had their cell phones thrown away. They have no way to get in touch 
with their families. They don't know where they are. They have very little to eat. They have no, no place to sleep. And Nogales is rife with cartel members. Across the street from where I work at the Comedor, Barb and Scott have been there. Across the street, up on the hill, stand the sicarios, the assassins, who are working for the cartels. They're watching us with binoculars. The young boy that I told you about was ripe for the picking. All he has to do is walk out of that Comedor by himself. Somebody calls ahead to a guy that's standing around the corner. The guy goes up to him and says, hey, have you ever been to Nogales before? No. Do you know where you are? No. Well, come with me. Come on, let me show you. That's it. And once you are in, once you've been taken, there is absolutely nothing you can do except to give up your life. That's it. And that's what most people don't understand. They do not understand. You talk a little bit about the back, backlash and the threats and the um, you know response to what you do from uh, both sides of the border and. Okay. Um, well, interestingly enough, I don't really have threats from Mexico. <laughs> However, um, we <laughs> we have Minutemen in our community, less so now than maybe five or six years ago because there were. Um, three minute men, a minute woman from Seattle, um, who Shauna Ford was her name, and her sidekick Jason Bush, who was being investigated for serial killing. Um, they got in touch with one of the minute men, one of the high mucky mucks in our community, and decided between them that they would come down to our, to basically where we're living. Um, a little bit further out in the desert, and they were going to rob drug dealers um, of not the drugs but of their money uh, to, to use that money for purposes of whatever they wanted to use it for to beef up their organization. And they were targeting um, a young man and his family who live in a place called Arivaca, which is 23 miles back Kitty Wampus off I-19, which is the freeway that runs from Tucson to Mexico, okay? And uh, they had all of this planned, and there was a fellow who was working in Arivaca at the feed store who was involved with this too. Uh, Alberto Gaxiola was his name. And at 5.30 in the morning, uh, Shauna Ford and Jason Bush burst into the home of this, of this young man, Raul Flores, um, his wife was in the bedroom. Um, she was armed. Raul was not armed. Their nine-year-old daughter um, was in the room with Raul. Um, their older daughter was at her grandmother's in the town close to where I live. And uh, at any rate, they broke in fully armed, and um, they were going to rob him of money. And the daughter, Bresiana was her name, said, why are you trying to kill my mommy and daddy? And with that, they shot her in the head. And they shot and killed Raul. And the mother, who had the gun, shot Jason in the leg. Didn't kill him, obviously, but shot him in the leg. They fled, and they didn't stop for help until they got pretty close, I think, to the California border. And they had to stop. And by then, word had gotten out that this had happened. and. So they were captured, and they both, uh, both of them were sentenced to death. So they're on death row in Arizona. I uh, don't know what happened to the other individual who was involved in this. But at any rate, once that happened, uh, the Minutemen who used to have, they would drive Jeeps, and they had Minutemen Civil Defense Corps across the front windshield, OK? They kind of backed off for a while. Um, but recently, they've started up again, and what they are doing is they're sitting close to the border. They're fully armed. And many of my friends and myself believe that they've probably taken out a lot of migrants and disposed of them. I mean, who could ever find somebody on the desert, really and truly? And I, I, have, no, uh, I have no compunctions about saying that. 
I don't have that as a fact, but knowing what they do, they used to sit in front of my house. So, you know, they're nuts, as quite frankly, as I see it, they think they're protecting the country. They're not. When you hear uh, someone like Donald Trump say what he said and politicians <laughs> talk about the wall, um, you know, what's your reaction, both maybe viscerally and then, um, you know, academically or intellectually as well? What's your reaction? To How about it's mostly my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, the statements that he makes are so totally unfounded. And I know that there are a faction of people in the United States and elsewhere who believe what he's saying, you know, that they're only coming for this, they're, most of them are rapists, most of them are murderers. It, it, that just speaks volumes um, about what he doesn't know and what he doesn't understand. He just doesn't understand this. And I, you know, I really, I can't say that I stepped back when I heard him say that because I really basically wasn't surprised. I don't think, what I love about so much of this is, well, I, I don't love it, but what I, it's just preposterous to me are the, are the groups of uh, Congress people who will go to the border and feel, and they go to the Arizona border, and they feel like they've really seen the border. They've really seen what is going on, when in fact they haven't seen anything. And this wall that is, is, encompasses the border is 15 feet tall, okay? There's a film of two young women climbing that wall, and they timed them. And one woman climbed, young women, one woman climbed it in 15 seconds, and another did it in 17 seconds. And what, what the coyotes will do to get people over the wall sometimes is that they will have people climb, and there obviously is a way of doing this. These are, um, the wall in part is built with um, um, Vietnam landing mats which are steel, of course, and there's about this much space between them. So there's enough, there's enough space to be able to um, fashion your feet to go up and to hang on. And what the coyotes will do is that they will put a rope over the top so that when someone gets to the top, they will lower themselves down. Um, and I've only heard of one fatal accident and the rope broke and some, some person died on that. Um, so I think that he, like so many people, again, just simply does not understand. He sees this in a very myopic way and cannot see the humanity, which is very, very unfortunate. And here is someone who has everything imaginable and wants more. And that, to me, is the crux of the situation, not only here and in Mexico, but around the world. There are too few with too much, and too many with, with nothing. And those who have nothing, for the most part, only want to be able to support their families, to f educate their children, and not unlike what any of us in this room would, would want. One more question, then, and then we'll turn it over to you guys for some questions. It's for Alejandro. When we talked um, a couple of days ago, uh, you talked about your work bring, bringing and reintroducing beauty, uh, but um, there was also an element of empowerment. Um, and if you could talk about uh, that when you introduce people to your work and, and uh, introduce maybe some young people to the, to the arts, can you talk about uh, the empowerment um, that comes with what you do? Of course, I, I mean, I, I think Ignorance is one of the uh, most powerful uh, impediments uh, to to progress, and uh, I think Mr. Trump is just a racist, ignorant, stupid person. That's it. No. Uh, and as Shurahir said, it wasn't a surprise 
because uh, we don't expect anything more of this kind of people because we have a lot of, of uh, not a lot, but we have uh, a small group in Mexico who has all the power. I mean, we have Carlos Slim who actually owns the country. Uh, if you, <laughs> I mean, we, we are always saying that if you have a cell phone or, or if you go on that uh, airplane, uh, I, I don't know, you are always working for Slim. No, uh, some per percentage of your money always go to, to Slim. And I think uh, people is getting used to it. I, I mean, people is always thinking that's the way it is. We know how, the, uh, uh, last night we were talking about this situation with our Armando and Antonio and Barbara, uh, my colleagues of, of Facto Teatro, and uh, Armando said something very, very uh, true. Everybody knows what's going on in Mexico, but everybody knows also how to take advantage of this situation. Because in Mexico, if you, if you have uh, an economical crisis, you can always go outside your house and put a tamale, a, a stand of tamales or selling anything you, 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 you want on the streets, even though it's forbidden, because the only thing you have to do is to give money to somebody and they will let you, uh, they, they will leave you alone. And uh, I think one of the most powerful tools we have is to uh, also bring art and uh, more knowledge to people, not, not only art, I, 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 I mean, uh, people is too busy just uh, trying to survive, that uh, there is no, no space for for uh, amusement, for uh, for for half five minutes to just to relax and say, okay, let me read. I don't care if it's a book, a magazine, anything. I, I just want to 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 sit down and watch TV. I want to disconnect my myself from me because I deserve at least a moment of disconnection of this tragic uh, life. No, I, I mean I'm I'm trying to 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 expose uh, something, but. Uh, I think now with, uh, that we, uh, th there's a lot of people in Mexico trying to, to give, uh, again, the people the chance to, to enjoy uh, art and to, uh, to tell them this is not only for, for leader, uh, I mean, for, for, um, mm, how say, for um, sort of intellectual people. It, it's also for you because uh, on, on TV, they're always saying to you, art is boring, art is for dumps, uh, art is, is not good for you. You have to see these sparking lights uh, and, and you have to uh, try to look like this uh, or to look like, like that and you have to wear these clothes and, you know, it's so much pressure, so much pressure. And outside the big cities, people is just star starving, they don't care. And also, I mean, I've been touring in the U.S. since since, uh, since the year 1996, and uh, when I go to to cities like Chicago or New York, where there's this huge Mexican population, it's very. I mean, we don't have Mexicans in the audience because they are working, right. you know. And they are uh, when we talk to them, they say, oh, "Oh, I would love to go, but I can't." Either I'm working or I'm too tired to go, or it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's very desperate, and it's the same case in Mexico. And uh, now the government is really trying to kill the cultural institutions and the, uh, and the theater groups and the music groups that, that, that have something to say, and they are doing a really good job, which is very sad. So it's, it's hard to survive as an artist, but I think we have to keep doing doing it, you know, because it's not that we are, in facto teatro, uh, have a, fl a political flag saying uh, we are this or we are that. No, what we are trying to say is that it doesn't matter what are your beliefs or your political uh, tendencies. Art is for everybody, and it's it's for you also, and you can do it and you can enjoy it. And please come. No, I don't know. I think we'll turn it over to questions. So. Uh, please feel free to fire away. So as high profile as both of you are, uh, you, you did mention how your, how your life was threatened by these, uh, but in other ways, have, have your lives been threatened? 
the word personal personally? Not because I'm an artist, but because I'm a citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm more scared walking by night on my city uh, of having an encounter with a police patrol than mm -hmm. with a criminal. Oh. Because police have a badge and they, they have the law on their side. And they can just make you disappear if they want to. They can kidnap you or they can kill you or they can beat you. It doesn't matter because they are the law. Ha, ha, ha. No? And uh, the, the thing is that there is no division between crime and police or government. It's the same thing because you cannot understand the way Mexico is now without the bless and the participation of every level of society. I mean, also, as the people, we are part of the problem because it always is like uh, um, uh, Armando also said last night. I mean, we are always complaining about the government and the politician, but what about us? Who, who buys the drugs? Who buys the, who, who pays the police just to get free? Uh, who, who is the other part of the corruption? And this uh, other, this, this victimization of the people is used by the powerful people to say, okay, you are good and uh, there's evil. We are going to fight evil. Okay, let's go fight it. But uh, at the same time, they are asking money for everything. I mean, it, it's just, it's very complex because really corruption is a way of living. And it's really hard to break this, this structure. It's, it, uh, it's almost impossible at this point. Um, I'm cautious. I mean, I'm always watching in the United States and where I live, um, specifically where I live. I'm always looking at, you know, the cars that go by and things like that. When I'm in Mexico, um, I now I would not go to Mexico by myself at night. Um, I, I go to Mexico at night for a demonstration about a, young, um, about a young man who was shot and killed by the Border Patrol, but there are a lot of us who go, so I don't, I don't have any compunctions about doing that. Um, during the day when I'm there, I know so many people, and I, I treat everybody with as much kindness as I can, to tell you the truth. If somebody wants a pair of socks, I give them a pair of socks, and um, I'm always you know, I'm friendly to people, and I know that a lot of the people are, are not um, particularly savory characters, but I can't make that judgment about what put that person in the position that he, he or she happens to be in at any given time. And as my mother used to say, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar any day. So I'm willing to do what I have to do, um, and I don't, a lot of people ask me that, aren't you afraid to go, aren't you afraid to go? And I'm not. I have no fear about going at all. So. But you said earlier that, uh, you know, you, you fear what's happening in your community more than you do in Mexico. Well, yes, yeah, um, largely because of the Minutemen, you know, and, and what they're up to. Although, again, um, they're, they're positioning themselves on the border. I'm 35 miles north of the border. So they're, and they're out in the, in the boondocks, in a sense. I mean, they're not sitting right along the wall that is adjacent to Nogales, as an example. I mean, they're going out in areas where they feel that people are crossing and people for the most part are not crossing right under the noses of, of Border Patrol. Sometimes that happens, but for the most part they're not. They're going very circuitous routes. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't have a fear there. Anyone else? No. Um, Michael, sorry, I'll try to get to you. Um, I, a few years ago, I spent a day um, photographing the on um, the King Anvil Ranch. Yes. And um, two things. <coughs> One thing that really struck me and one thing I could not wrap my arms around. The thing that struck me was the, uh, that night, the, the number of people that crossed in that one small area. So I, I'd uh, like you to talk a little bit about how many people were involved, how many people crossed the border. Okay. And the thing that I couldn't really understand or wrap my arms around was the, the relationship between the Minutemen 
in the Border Patrol. So, speak a little bit about that. I think. Um, I think the number of people who are crossing, it would be very hard for me to give you an exact number. I can't. But I do know from the people that I see at the Comedor on the days that I'm there, sometimes it's up to 100 people, um, sometimes it's more. Um, and many of the people who are there have been in the United States for years, as I had said before. And so their family is here. They want to get back. Um, you know, Uh, it's it's difficult. I can't really answer exactly how. I mean, I would never know exactly how many, but it's thousands of people crossing. That night, the minute stretched out for I, I think it was about five miles. Yes. You know, yes. Right in sight. Mm -hmm. And um, they saw over two hundred, over two hundred people yes. crossing Just in that five mile area. And I think the King Anvil Ranch is actually a ways from the border. It is. It is. You're, you're right about so that. So it, yeah. it was just amazing to think about the numbers and the density and, the, uh -huh. you know, the way it, it, it filtered, it would filter across. And, and, and one, um, one body, 200 people, 200 living people in one body. Yeah. It was yeah. just, it was phenomenal. Thing. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is thousands. And, and they, they go into very, very desolate areas. I mean, just unbelievably desolate areas. And because they don't know. And what if they're with a group and they have a coyote, the coyote says, when you cross the border, it's five miles to Tucson. And, and they have no reason to not, they want to believe that. Obviously, like any of us, it's really, it's only five miles, I think I can make it. But in fact, it isn't like that. And if you, if you fall ill during your journey, that's tough luck. No one, for the most part, is going to stay with you. And there was a story, um, this, this happened, this is just such one of these, well, everything is tragic actually in this situation, but a 14-year-old girl named Hoseline who was traveling with a group with her 10-year-old brother and they were trying to reunite with their mother who was in Los Angeles. And um, they got to a point, Hoseline, they were up in the mountains, out of this town, not very far. We need to, we need to wrap, wrap up. up. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's okay. I can talk more about this after. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry to cut No, you it's off, okay. But, um, you have to. My, my crew is doing <laughs> that. I want to thank both of you, of course, and all of you uh, for being here. And please come to more festival offerings. And very quickly, if you haven't gotten enough, Cheryl is doing an entire lecture tomorrow at Landmark. No, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow at Landmark College at seven o'clock. There's also, sorry, seven o'clock. Oh, seven o'clock in our program. We will double check on that. We'll be there, not to worry. And there's also. Performance, a free performance in the landmark lawn before the talk at 7:30. No, at 6:30. <laughs> at 6:30 in our program, but we will check on that. Um, and Alejandro and his whole company with Made of Paper has one more show at three o'clock today. So please also come to that. Thank you so much. Please let this conversation continue. I know there's so much more to be said about it. So continue the dialogue. I will, I will have a number of items that I found on the desert um, that, that I would like for people to see and to pick up and to just imagine the journey.